Hi, welcome to my channel. The previous uh, part one of this uh, video unintentionally stopped early, so I'm continuing it in this video. Here we will mainly discuss some of the uh, antenatal concerns and then go on to a couple of postnatal concerns as well. So, antenatal hydronephrosis is not uncommon. We hear that frequently. Our obstetric colleagues inform us that this can show uh, hydronephrosis. Bilateral moderate hydronephrosis in the male baby, we definitely need to rule out posterior urethral valve and an early scan by day two would be advisable. However, looking at the urinary stream is a good guide as well. And if the stream is normal and it was not very significant antenatally, you can wait for two to three days. If the baby is passing urine well and it's a unilateral scan uh, or mild to moderate in a female baby, we can do the scan at three to five days of age or later. We should avoid that in the first two days as there is the dehydration that is seen which you can result in underestimating the size of the hydronephrosis. So uh, this is to show you the normal system, the kidneys, the ureter, the bladder which is not dilated or trabeculated and the normal urethra and uh, you can see the normal pelvic LCL system. Here there is hydronephrosis obviously, there is uh, effacing of the pelvic LCL junction, dilatation of the calyces. The ureters appear dilated, the bladder has uh, dilated thickened walls which are trabeculated. This is due to the force needed to contract to empty. And then you have the dilatation of the proximal urethra with an obstruction. So this is a typical picture we find in posterior urethral valve, which is definitely uh, more common in males. Many of, many of these cases may be having associated oligohydramnias. That's why the prenatal evaluation uh, includes uh, scan at the second trimester which may show more than or equal to four millimeter and then you follow it up if it is unilateral you can repeat at third trimester and if it is more than seven millimeter as i said we need a postnatal scan after three to seven days if it is moderate or severe after seven days for mild to moderate so uh, the definition of uh, mild moderate and severe varies normally 10 to 15 millimeter is taken as moderate and more than 15 is taken as severe mild is less than 10 the postnatal scans. Bilateral hydronephrosis, you may have oligohydramnias, which makes it very serious and a risk assessment and multidisciplinary approach is needed. If it is not associated with oligohydramnias, you do a serial antenatal scan every two to six weeks. And then if the oligohydramnias develops again, your management will depend on the gestational age, because if it's a later gestation, you may want to deliver early for the risk of pulmonary hypoplasia. If the oligohydramnias is not there and the kidney dilatation is more than seven, uh, we need to do the postnatal ultrasound again. As I said, if it's a male with distended bladder or moderate severe antenatal hydronephrosis, you do it early. Or uh, if it is milder, you do it later. If there is an associated systemic malformation, you have to provide appropriate counseling as per the malformation. There are so many guidelines for postnatal ultrasound and uh, it's always variable. This is from uh, Indian Journal of Nephrology published in 2013. So this is a reasonable one except for the definition of the uh, 7 to 10 millimeter where many, many of us use up to 12 millimeter and some even up to 15 if there are no other concerns. The SFU grade uh, depends on how the pelvic LCL system uh, effacement is there, what is the dilatation of the pelvis and so on. So if it is a mild hydronephrosis, no intervention is needed. And uh, if there is no hydronephrosis, sorry, no intervention, less than seven millimeter anterior posterior pelvic diameter. If it is mild without ureteric dilatation, APD seven to 10 millimeter after third day of scan, ultrasound every three to six months until resolution. Uh, majority in the 10 to 12 millimeter fall in this category as well. That's why most of us include less than 10 as mild, less than 12 as mild. And moderate to severe hydronephrosis where it's more than 10 to 12 uh, or it's mild with ureteric dilatation. We have to do a micturating cystourethrography with adequate precautions to prevent infection being introduced. If there is no vesicuretric reflex, you do a diuretic renography, no obstruction, you can follow with ultrasound. If there is an obstructed pattern, uh, depends on the differential function and you may need surgery. Uh, most surgeons do not operate immediately, they monitor. 
Again, if there is vesicuretric reflex, you start antibiotic prophylaxis. Otherwise, you don't really need antibiotic prophylaxis in this category. If there is evidence of lower urinary tract obstruction, obviously a urology referral and review would be needed. The next common concern we have antenatally is maternal hypothyroidism. It's very common as common as maternal diabetes these days. So you check for the history of previous hyperthyroidism because many times Graves' disease may have been treated with ablation or uh, medical treatment and the mother is now hypothyroid as a result. So you should not miss because the antibodies which are there in Graves' disease continue to exist and they may cross the placenta and may cause either hyper or hypothyroidism in the baby. If there is simple hypothyroidism, you send the newborn screen and you can consider the thyroid function test if the newborn screen is abnormal or if you have concerns like prolonged jaundice when you would do the thyroid function as well. If there is a previous history of hyperthyroidism, you do the thyroid function on day 2 to 3 and repeat according to the clinical condition. So if it is simple maternal hypothyroidism, which is the commonest type, the newborn screening is adequate. But if you are not able to do the newborn screen, it's better to do the thyroid function. There are many concerns that are seen on antenatal scans, including single umbilical artery, echogenic bubble, choroid plexus or germinal matrix cyst, antenatal ventriculomegaly in the brain, especially in the lateral ventricle, and echogenic focus in the heart. Single umbilical artery is not uncommon. It's seen in around 1 in 100 pregnancies. If it's an isolated single umbilical artery with no other markers on the antenatal scans, the risk of anomaly is not high. If there are other soft markers, there is around 30% chance of associated malformations in the GIT, uh, in the kidneys or in the heart. Karyotyping could be advised as well as close monitoring of the scans. Growth monitoring and Doppler studies are indicated as associated growth restriction may be there. If the baby is growing well and the scans are normal, we don't need to worry and most likely baby will be normal as well. So this is the uh, two arteries and the single vein which is left and here in single umbilical artery, a single artery is going to supply the whole baby, I mean bring blood back from the whole baby. Echogenic bubble is again another benign finding, not too uncommon. So you can see here that the bubble looks quite bright and this is how it looks from the distance when the fetal scan is being done. In majority of the situations, it may be due to an antenatal maternal bleed with the liquor being blood stained, the baby swallowed the blood and the blood which is being resorbed is resulting in some mycogenic focus. However, we cannot rule out conditions which cause inspissated meconium, especially cystic fibrosis. So if in a Caucasian population where there is a high risk, uh, you could consider cystic fibrosis. It's included in the newborn screening in most situations, so that should be adequate. Uh, associated malformations should be looked for more closely in this situation as well. So majority have no concern. The choroid plexus cyst again is uh, benign in most situations. However, there is a link with trisomies. So if the age or the associated scan malformation suggests, you may consider karyotyping. Most of them may resolve by 26 to 28 weeks. So a repeat scan if no other anomalies are uh, present, may be all that is needed. It's usually benign. It can be unilateral or bilateral. Bilateral, of course, you have to be more careful with the trisomies. The uh, germinal matrix cyst may be benign. It may be a variation uh, like uh, coarctation of the lateral ventricle or it may be due to an antenatal hemorrhage which is organizing. So majority of the cases if there is no ventriculomegaly monitoring and a postnatal scan is all that is needed. The same applies to dilatation of the lateral ventricle antenatally. If it is mild, you don't need to worry, you do a postnatal ultrasound. If there is associated hydrocephalus, you need to plan the delivery accordingly and uh, investigate after the baby is born. Echogenic focus in the heart is another common finding which is benign in most of the situations. The exact reason for that is not clear. Maybe some calcium deposit in the developing myocardium. However, most of them disappear and even if they don't disappear, postnatal scans are normal. So if the baby is clinically normal, the rest of the scans are normal. You don't need to worry about an echogenic focus in the heart. If there are other associated anomalies similar to the other concerns I mentioned, you may need to review that. Postnatally, one of the common worries is a sacral dimple. So here we have to look at the features. Can you see the bottom of the dimple? If you can see the bottom, you don't need urgent referral. 
later on he may result in poor leg movement or bowel uh, opening uh, like the anal sphincter difficulty but very rare to see that in the newborn period so these are examples many times we see this slightly curving to the side like a tail and the coccyx is obviously a remnant of the vestigial tail which uh, we don't have thankfully so remember that uh, slight deviations in that area are normal these are shallow dimples uh, the other risk factors include associated cutaneous finding like hypertrichosis or hemangioma over the dimple area or the sacral area or abnormal neurologic findings. If they are there, you need to do MRI or neurosurgical referral. If there are multiple dimples or a dimple diameter is more than 5 mm, the depth of the dimple is uh, more than 5 mm, so you can't see the end of it. If it's more than 2.5 cm above the anal verge, so it's significant and again outside the sacrococcygeal region, then you also you do an ultrasound or MRI. One common problem with the ultrasound is the expertise of the sonographers in sacral ultrasound may be limited and uh, MRI may be considered. The associated features may be tethered cord which can cause uh, limping gait and uh, paralysis later on in life and uh, that's one of the main factors we're looking at or a spina bifida occulta may be present you may refer to the neurology accordingly so these are the main pointers a dimple more than 5 millimeter diameter or depth more than 2.5 centimeter above the anus so just to summarize i will uh, present both uh, together as well as a video and i hope this is useful and do share thank you